30 to 35 minutes um, for the forums. And uh, I'm Ann Galloway. I'm the founder and uh, executive director of VT Digger in Montpelier. And I'm really happy to see you all here. Um, we have a Facebook Live um, uh, stream going on. Uh, we're also um, thankful that Orca is here to film the forum and we'll be posting the video later. Uh, we have bagels from Myers in, in uh, Chittenden County, which are fantastic if you haven't had a chance to get one yet. Um, and there's coffee. And uh, this is sponsored by Green State Gardener. Um, and uh, we're very glad to have Gwen Zakov with us to my right, Tom Little, and Jake Perkinson, all three of whom served on the Vermont Advisory, Marijuana Advisory Commission. And uh, Jake and Tom were co-chairs. So um, I'm going to do my best to summarize a little bit about where we are, because um, as you all know, Last year, we passed a marijuana uh, legalization uh, bill in the state of Vermont that uh, allowed people to purchase a small amount of marijuana and to grow a couple of plants. And now the legislature and the governor's office are considering a tax and regulation um, system, which is, I have to say, pretty darn complicated. If you look at the commission's report, which came out in December, um, it is uh, the, even the executive summary runs to some pages. So I think uh, it, it's very clear that the folks who are on the commission are really making an effort to uh, understand every facet of uh, of tax and regulation. And um, so where we are right now, I mean, big picture, uh, there is being uh, there is a tax being proposed um, by the Senate and Dick Sears committee. That's uh, Senate Judiciary. He wants a 10% excise tax, and an excise tax is a tax that's passed onto the consumer that you don't actually uh, see. Um, then there's the sales tax, which is 6%, and uh, most of these bills include a uh, a sales tax. Um, and then uh, Sam Young, a uh, representative from Glover in the House, actually he lives in Greensboro now, I sorry, correct that. Uh, he has um, also proposed a bill uh, that came out yesterday that would um, impose an 11% excise tax, a 3% local option tax, a on top of a sales tax. Um, and then the, the, the commission recommended a 26% excise tax, is that right? Oh, 20%, sorry, I got that wrong, 20%. So, um, I, I, so I, I know that's a lot of numbers to absorb early in the morning. <laughs> uh, but the point of all this is that uh, it actually costs money to regulate uh, a drug like marijuana. And uh, there are um, debates about how the drug should be regulated, um, what law enforcement should uh, be able to do, should they be able to um, uh, conduct roadside saliva testing. That's something the commission felt strongly about. Um, and uh, others have said uh, it's not as important. Dick Sears, for example, head of judiciary, uh, really doesn't want to see a roadside saliva test. Um, both Mitzi Johnson, the House Speaker, and Governor Phil Scott um, are for a roadside saliva test. Uh, even though at this point, really, there is no um, uh, connection between THC levels and impairment that uh, is reliable. So there are questions about that from a scientific standpoint. Um, there are um, drug recognition experts who are out there who um, you know, work for police agencies that um, recommend testing when someone appears to be impaired. Oh boy, I'm rambling on. I shouldn't have studied so much this morning. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else? Uh, one of the things that I found really interesting and I'm gonna ask the panel about is the Substance Misuse Advisory Committee, what that would look like and what it would mean um, for the state of Vermont, um, and you know how local mun municipalities would um, would, would deal with the placement of retail facilities around the state. So those are just a few of the things we're gonna be talking about. Um, and as always, um, I like to lead with reader questions um, because our readers are really thoughtful and they ask great questions. Um, so I'm gonna start um, with Deb Wolf, who emailed me the other day. She's from Middlesex. And um, she worries about 
um, the placement of, of um, retail marijuana shops near schools, churches, neighborhoods, and playgrounds. And I'm wondering uh, if you all think that's an issue. Well, it's, it's certainly an issue not only um, for a policy decision on behalf of the state of Vermont, but there's also, uh, with everything involved in cannabis, the uh, overlay of federal law and the continuing federal prohibition. And there are uh, increased penalties and specific legislation on the federal level uh, concerning um, drug activity in or around schools. In the current medical marijuana program, there is a prohibition on placing uh, retail and uh, cultivation facilities within, I think it's a thousand yards um, of a uh, child care center, church, um, school, uh, et cetera. And uh, particularly with respect to child care um, facilities, if you look at the map of where they're located and you include home daycare, it becomes extremely challenging to locate anything anywhere within a, uh, even a very small buffer zone. Uh, so if that policy decision is, is adopted and uh, you have a continuing prohibition against the location of retail shops, uh, as an example, um, you are going to have some challenges as far as location go. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the location of retail shops in particular, uh, we heard from the experts on the commission from the uh, Health and Education Committee, uh, we're very adamant about uh, the placement and availability of retail shops insofar as its influence on the perceptions of youth um, towards the use of cannabis. Uh, so those are important policy considerations. Um, I personally think that absolutely there should be some consideration, um, but again, given the practical challenges when you uh, pull in all of the home daycares and so forth, there may need to be some flexibility um, to actually provide spots where uh, the retail activity can happen. Um, I would just add that under um, current statute, um, we have um, our communities, our towns and our cities uh, do cluster development sort of in our downtown area. So it makes it even that much harder to locate these um, facilities and areas that are suitable just because settlement patterns have to look a certain way. So that thousand foot buffer zone adds an extra um, layer on top of the layers of um, our, our zoning bylaws generally saying they have to be, um, any development has to be in a downtown clustered area. Great, thank you. Um, Deb Wolf also asks um, whether habitual heavy use of marijuana is uh, necessary in order to support uh, a marijuana industry here in Vermont, and she worries about how that could impact young people. The statistics that you often see cited are that a high percentage of the sales of regulated cannabis in states where it's 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 licensed for retail sale, um, a high percentage of the sales goes to a relatively small percentage of the population who are regular, uh, if not heavy users. So I think um, that's that's something to keep an eye on, and, and the the Education and Prevention Committee uh, and the rest of the commission's uh, work recommended a robust. Uh, gathering of information and statistics uh, along about that and other things. Going back to the, the local uh, impact issue, uh, there's a th threshold question that the, the commission actually was not able to come to a complete consensus on, and that is whether uh, we, Vermont in a regulated environment should be an opt-in or an opt-out state. An opt-in would mean that uh, cannabis-related businesses, including uh, retail sales, would not happen in any town unless the town affirmatively voted to allow them. That's opt-in. The opt-out model would be, uh, the towns would be given an, a, a period of time in which to take a vote to opt-out so that no cannabis-related businesses would be happening in that town. Uh, those are the two, two models, and um, as I said, the consensus was we leave that to the General Assembly. <laughs> nice punt on that one. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, uh, so the next question is from Dave Crowley from Bennington, and this is directed at Jake. Um, 
he says that you argue that investing in additional law enforcement resources is a necessary step in rolling out a legal market. Citing California, Mr. Perkinson makes the argument that an illegal cannabis market is still thriving because the state failed to make an investment in police resources. How do you compare the policing needs of California, population 39.5 million and 164,000 square miles with the policing needs of Vermont, population 624,000 and 9,600 square miles? Doesn't this make the case for a lower tax on cannabis? Um, obviously, high taxes drive and sustain an illegal market. Why is there this discriminatory and prejudiced branding of cannabis users as out-of-control people? Um, and there are more comments, but I'm going to stop there. <laughs> yeah, uh, first I would say that it, it certainly is uh, valid and important to make distinctions between California and Vermont. Uh, California obviously is the size of a small country and Vermont's the size of a mid-sized city. So uh, as far as the allocation of resources, there are going to be differences and there will be differences in economies of scales and the efficiency with which we can approach the issue. Um, <clears throat> having said that, uh, I think that in analyzing the issue, it's not limited to California, that my comments would be applicable to other uh, states as well, including Oregon, Washington, uh, Colorado. Uh, where they face the challenge of an existing market which has been operating outside of the law for over 60 years and trying to bring that within the purview of a regulated system. Um, obviously, you know, uh, as the Founding Fathers said, if, if uh, people were angels, we wouldn't need government. People aren't angels. Um, and uh, you really need to pay close attention to how you're going to incentivize people who are currently operating outside of a legal regulated market to come into that market. Uh, and so obviously one uh, approach and really the main focus of uh, the legalization push has been to provide a legal market in which they can operate. Uh, however, uh, in the context of the United States of America where you will continue to have jurisdictions where there is uh, a prohibition, there will be uh, an incentive to uh, to at least uh, operate under, uh, continue to operate illegally or to operate within a legalized system and, and uh, provide that product to um, uh, areas where it's not uh, permitted. Uh, we saw an example of that in recently in Burlington where there was a shop selling product produced from states where it is legal being sold in, in Vermont. So. Um, I, I believe uh, that you can't simply say, now it's legal and expect everybody to come in and join the regulated system, as long as there remains an incentive for people to operate outside that system. And I think part of eliminating that incentive would require um, a robust enforcement mechanism uh, to ensure that those bad actors that are not within the system uh, will have accountability and the threat of enforcement. And really, if you don't have that, you're punishing the people that are electing to operate within the regulated system. And I think that's the most unfair part about it. Um, and so while I, I certainly appreciate the, uh, the comments and understand that there's um, a lot of emotions wrapped up in this. Um, uh, the way that I look at it is really from a pragmatic standpoint of what is going to bring the most amount of people into a regulated market and prevent the most amount of product from being um, uh, put out you know, and being available in an illegal manner, especially to minors. I just wanted to add to that. Um, so every state that has legalized so far um, has a very different law enforcement envir environment in general. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a uh, town or city in um, almost any state that's legalized that uh, doesn't have a police department or a, um, a robust county sheriff um, in place. That simply just doesn't exist in Vermont at the level um, in other states, including well, all of the out west, but um, also in Massachusetts and um, Maine. So considerations for um, how um, a community might be um, impacted, whether it be a rural grow facility or a downtown retail operation, consideration of um, what kind of wraparound law enforcement is in existence is actually really important because it, it simply might not be there at all. Great, thank you. 
Mike Rogers from Colchester wants to know, can the legislature assure us that smoking marijuana will not be in 20 or 10 or 20 years a major health issue like cigarettes were and are right now? <laughs> no. Um, I think I would urge people to read the report from the Education and Prevention Subcommittee that's incorporated into the commission's uh, overall report. And uh, the folks on that subcommittee um, are health and education professionals and uh, also involved in uh, prevention and treatment of uh, substance abuse uh, patients and families dealing with substance abuse. No, no, I don't think anyone can make a guarantee. And if someone's looking for a guarantee, um, they're, 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 that, that, that we, we can't pur purport to, to do that. Um, and in fact, I think if you polled the, the members of the Education and Prevention Subcommittee, they'd say, don't do it. Yeah, um, and in fact, the, the Vermont Department of Health uh, has uh, compiled a health impact statement, which is um, extremely detailed about the existing scientific research on cannabis. But the unfortunate part about you know trying to make uh, comments on what the health effects of cannabis are is the lack of scientific study or lack of studies that are generally accepted in the scientific community, and that has, of course. Uh, in, is in large part due to the fact of the federal prohibition and the lack of availability for cannabis uh, research uh, opportunities throughout the United States. That's beginning to change, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I would echo that nobody can make any guarantees. We just, we simply don't know um, what the long-term effects uh, will be. And Ann, I'd, I'd add that um, the, the governor's advisory commission was not asked to give a recommendation or an opinion about whether Vermont should move to uh, taxed and regulated retail sales. We were asked if before Vermont was going to make that decision, before the decision makers were going to go there, what would the Vermont version of that look like if you made that decision? And that's really, um, you know, the, the governor and the legislators are the ones who have to decide whether Vermont should do that. We were just saying, if you if you make that choice, this is these are some guidelines you should follow. Thank you, Tom, for clarifying that. Um, you know, there there seem to be a lot of questions about the tax itself and the level that would be appropriate. And uh, William Magnus from Swanton um, wants to know whether a, a twenty percent tax will perpetuate the black market. Um, couldn't we just go with the sales tax, is basically what he's saying. Um, and you do see these bills in the legislature that have a lower excise tax level. I wondered if you could talk about why you all came up with 20%. I, I think um, it's 20% in the, in, the, in the commission's report plus the 6% right. sales tax plus in towns and cities where there's the local option tax, it could be Another, another penny on the tax. That's kind of sort of in the middle of where other states have gone. Um, we kind of threw a dart in the, in the middle of that. Um, it, it's, it should be, I think we've mentioned this before, but it should be emphasized to, for a state government to try to control and regulate and tax and license a market that's in existence, been in existence for 60 plus years, that's churning millions and millions of dollars worth of sales in Vermont is no small undertaking. Uh, regardless of how much money we spend on law enforcement, um, that market, it will be, an, in my opinion, will be a, a, a persistent. And if we had a 3% sales tax on, on cannabis sales in Vermont, I think the underground market would persist as well. Um, we've, been, we've, we've read recently that the state of California is now considering lowering its excise tax to put more pressure on the underground market. Uh, but I think the, the, the folks in Vermont, uh, and, and who are at least as ingenious as those in California, um, uh, who, are, who, are, who have been growing and, and processing and selling cannabis 
for decades are, uh, many of them are likely to try to continue that because that's the business they're in now. And to, for them to spend the money to get the license to upgrade and rent the space and go public, this may be uh, unattractive to them. Um, so I just think we need to be, we go, need, the state needs to go into this with its eyes wide open. Um, just, just to <clears throat> flesh out some of the logistics be, behind coming up with the 20%, uh, the, um, the tax department worked with the uh, Joint Fiscal Office to come up with estimates about um, what tax, what, what amount of money would be required, looking at what the expected sales in Vermont could be, and then calculating the tax off of that. And that's really what the analysis was in coming up with that 20%. Um, and uh, that is, I think that's actually uh, slightly lower than the majority of states as far as a tax rate overall. Some, ta some states tax at the wholesale level, some have other means of taxation, but at the end of the day, I think Vermont's 20% proposal would be uh, uh, on the lower side. Um, so I, I feel that um, it's, it's just important to, to recognize that, that that process was gone through under the assumption that um, it was going to fund the necessary programs that the, committee, that the commission had deemed uh, appropriate in the event of a legalized market. So it wasn't uh, that simply to uh, fund the uh, administrative agency, but also to fund the programs in the, through the health department and through um, educational facilities, uh, as well as uh, the Department of Public Safety uh, for roadway safety. And so we tried to you know, figure out what all the costs of that would be and come up with a reasonable tax rate uh, that would fund those. And so that, you know, really it, it's sort of a philosophical shift where you're saying, you know, um, and, and th that's kind of what concerns me about the proposal just to have a, um, a straight tax that goes into the general fund because then it goes in the general fund and it gets dissipated to whatever through the appropriations process. And at that point, you're not having direct accountability with respect to the effects of this particular product. So we have an opportunity to have everybody who's participating and chooses to participate in this market to bear the burden of what the effects of this are. And I'm not saying the effects are necessarily negative, but there are effects, there are requirements to uh, uh, regulation. And so I, I uh, readily admit that that's a, a departure from uh, what is typically the case, but I think that if we have this opportunity to do it, you can step back in time and, and imagine what it would be like if that was the same philosophy applied to uh, licenses to drill for oil and where we'd be today. Um, so the opportunity to have uh, sort of this anticipatory approach, I think, is, is a valuable one and one well worth exploring. Question about that? Would that tax be uh, the same for medical marijuana users as uh, recreational users? There's no tax on uh, medical marijuana. No, I know at the moment. Yeah, but I mean, in the future, would that stay the same? That's right. The legislature could do something entirely different, but I doubt they would go there. Um, just quickly before I go to Ken, um, I, I took a few notes. Uh, I took the liberty of taking a few notes, and the range is Oregon at 17 percent, uh, Massachusetts at 20, California at 27, Colorado at 30, and Washington State at 37. So 20% is even a little bit on the low side compared with other states that have uh, implemented a tax and regulation system. Ken, you have a question? Yeah, I'm just concerned about your, the effects that seem a little vague and I'm not hearing, isn't there, you know, torts and like, you know, if, if you hurt somebody because you're under the influence, mm -hmm. there are all sorts, I mean, it seems to me like this whole discussion I mean, why not just legalize it and if people break the law, they're held accountable. They cause damage, they're held accountable. I mean, it seems, I mean, you, you understand, like, philosophically, people like, what, what incentives do people have to give up this existing system or non system, or however you want to, you know, it's, it's outside, of, outside of all this regulation, but the spirit of it is very different than government step in and regulate it. Um, and you know, I mean, I'm not really a libertarian, but there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of cross 
crossover, it's just like, why not? What are the real effects? I, I don't, can, can you elaborate on what? Well, the, the um, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll offer a few, a few uh, comments in response. Um, there are people who are not consuming cannabis now because they, they're not comfortable uh, not, not knowing what they're buying. They want, uh, and they will feel more comfortable if they could go to a, a retail store where the product has been, um, in a sense, regulated by the state, tested by the state, tested for uh, 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 pesticides and herbicides, and for the potency of it so that they know what they're buying. So that, that provides a level of consumer protection that is presumably not available otherwise. Um, and uh, then there's the, the I'll just by, by reference to the, mention the, the education and prevention efforts that the commission is recommending uh, to build stronger uh, education and prevention programs in Vermont, particularly for the, our, our younger, our younger residents. Yeah, I think I think that's right, and those are those are contained in the commission's report. There's an outline specifically of what the anticipated uh, cost of uh, the programs recommended to be implemented are. Um, and again, you know, the the youth programs are an important part of it. I don't think that you can say that there's going to be no effect. There's there's clearly um, a a a shift. There's a shift that's going on already. Vermont has legalized cannabis and. Uh, that causes a shift in perception, and so I think it is important to uh, give young people the tools to uh, evaluate um, the effects that uh, they might that they might be exposed to. Um, the, I, the other thing I would mention is that the administration of it is is not free. You know, the medical program has a budget of I think somewhere between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars, and they regulate five entities. And so, uh, you know, I think that. Um, it, there is going to be a lot of costs associated with it. It's already has been uh, uh, mentioned, uh, and you know, having a laissez-faire is what we have now. I'm, I'm not sure if, if the proposal is just to let it keep going and just not prosecute. I don't think that's a viable option, um, and I don't think it's fair to people because there are effects. I don't think you can deny that you know any commercial activity has an effect. Uh, and I think Vermont should definitely have the benefit of taxing that commercial activity, and those taxes should go towards, first and foremost, um, addressing any effects that are caused by that activity. Could you all um, recall for us how much revenue is anticipated from marijuana sales overall? Um, the uh, tax department worked with the legislature's uh, joint fiscal office looking at uh, what's being recorded for revenue in the other states where it is licensed for retail sale. We, uh, they prorated that to the Vermont population and market and came up with a low, medium, and high revenue estimate, and those were uh, as it rolled out, and the, the low um, estimate per year was in the range of 10 or $11 million, and the high was in the $20 million range. Uh, one of the tricks to the, on the revenue side is when do you start collecting the revenue? Um, and uh, if you're trying to pay for the cost of the governmental infrastructure that's going to regulate it, when, how does that, when do you, which you may need before you actually are regulating and, and taxing the sales, how do you, how do you pull that one off? It's a, it's a chicken or egg problem, right? <laughs> I mean, the, some, some people have suggested you could uh, somehow bond. Some have suggested you might be able to bond in anticipation of the tax revenues because a lot of, uh, many, many, if not all, Vermont school districts and towns will borrow money in anticipation of, of property tax revenues um, in the slow times of the year and then pay back the bonds when the tax revenue comes in. You could conceivably do something like that. The trouble there is, is, is you keep bumping into this federal law prohibition 
And if you're bonding, trying to issue um, a debt instrument like bonds that's sold in the public market, that's regulated by the federal government, you run it, you, you bump into a real problem there. And that's um, going back to, to our comments earlier about uh, law enforcement. Uh, this is not only a, a robust underground market, it's a cash market. Um, and the, the licensed uh, version of it would also presumably be largely cash for the time being. Uh, and so the numbers that you're talking about, sorry, second please. Uh, the numbers you're talking about in terms of revenue, they don't include purchases by people from out of state who are visiting to ski or hike or whatever, right? It's just local, local use? Oh, they do take in? Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, we're taking questions, not comments. So if you can come up with a question, I'm going to ask one now. And then, uh, so many people on the pro side of legalization, this is from Kim Hubbard in Jericho. Ah, Kim, there we go. Okay, Kim, you want to go? You want to ask your question? Good, okay. Okay, great. I'm glad you're here. Many people on the pro side of legalization seem to conflate legalization with commercialization. Recently, I was horrified by a Canadian advertisement marketing marijuana featuring children's voices. A fundamental question for anyone making decisions regarding regulating marijuana is, what are your intentions for regulating commercialization of products containing THC? Now, you all have a whole section on advertising in your report, right? You want to talk about commercialization? Well, the, the uh, recommendations on commercial, on advertising specifically uh, came both out of the Tax and Regulate Subcommittee as well as the Health and Education Subcommittee. Health and Education, I think, had the more uh, detailed um, recommendations with respect to time and place of sales, um, limiting the placement of advertising so that uh, the, the medium could credibly be uh, argued to only have. I think it should be legalized. I, so, I mean... I sometimes I, I make comments and people think that that's an argument for not legalizing. My my position is it should be legalized, but it should be done in a way that's responsible and that protects children and um, public safety. So the reality is any product uh, can only grow if it has new customers. And so you see in the tobacco industry, and people may not like that analogy, but um, <clears throat> it's, a good, it's a good example of a uh, industry that understands how to grow their market, and you grow the market by being attractive to new customers. And um, that means uh, trying to attract children. And so I do believe that there should be a concerted effort to prevent that from happening. We understand that that will be an incentive for any company. Um, if they're looking at their bottom line, they will want to have new customers. The new customers are youth. And so if we know that, we can uh, operate in a way that will hopefully address that ahead of time and uh, um, cut them at the, off at the pass, so to speak. So th those are the generalized recommendations with respect to, to advertising, and I really do focus uh, mostly on preventing youth access and incentivizing youth to use the product. Is there anything, is there anything in there that provides countermeasures similar to what's happened with tobacco and even alcohol in terms of public health risk and, and, and sort of pushing back on the, the glorified messages that the cannabis industry is going to be obviously promoting and the public safety? Because I work with kids. I work, I'm, a, I'm a substance abuse professional. I've worked in this field for many years. And uh, you know, when you talk to children that they have to be armed them with the facts, they're trying to make very good choices. If they put out that, they'll, they'll, they'll crack it. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, read from uh, uh, the report. Um, limiting advertising can reduce youth initiation and overall use. Prohibiting self-service displays, internet sales, free samples, mass media advertising, 
and flavored products should be a part of any commercial cannabis regulation. And advertising restrictions should be implemented to ensure that youth and young adults are not targeted by or exposed to cannabis advertising. Uh, advertising should be restricted from any area where youth could potentially be exposed. Now, that all runs into some of our other illegal traditions in Vermont in this country concerning um, the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, but there are clear limits to that uh, in, the, in the commerce area. And I'll, I mean, specifically to your point about uh, counteractive measures, the proposal from the uh, Health and Education Subcommittee was to use funds from marijuana ta or cannabis taxation uh, to fund a statewide program uh, for education specifically directed at youth. Uh, and I think the price tag for that was set at somewhere as $8, $8 million. So $8 million, yeah. And it was, it was you know, so the, the idea is to have a robust program. and, and Obviously, there's also an ancillary uh, uh, benefit in that, you know, the conversation about cannabis, it wouldn't be restricted simply to that. It would be about all substances and hopefully uh, also counteract some of the uh, opioid issues that we have as well. And so, you know, it, it does present an opportunity, I think, to address a need that's not currently addressed with respect to substance abuse and funding programs for children in schools uh, to address that issue. Thank you. Well, it is now 8.48, and I think we've run out of time. It's been a great, oh, oh we have one more question. I just, um, following up on that last idea, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the panel, you know, considered not doing anything with the cannabis tax and not giving it legitimacy to the industry in light of the fact that we really don't have a model in the United States of where we've done that and not profoundly increased the number of users of which and Scientists tell us thirty percent are, are have use disorder, so which falls on the state, of course, to pay for. What I'm trying to say is, we have, you know, in Holland, we had marijuana for forty years. We did not give them, you know, personhood, corporate personhood, free speech rights. Um, yet it really is sort of a giveaway, enormous amount of rights from the people to the corporations, and like why? I mean, <laughs> and, and actually what we're seeing in Holland is that they're, they're reversing course. So people are saying, you know, we don't like that, and they're not bringing it up in the street or in the back. I think, I think um, those of, of, among us in our communities who feel strongly in, in that, on that theme uh, should uh, ask their legislators not to enact a retail regulated market. It's as simple as that. That is the question up on the hill here uh, this, this winter. Oh. There's a, uh, the Senate Finance Committee is taking testimony this afternoon on the tax and, and revenue side. I think starting at 1.30 in the Senate Finance. And then we have more questions and there was a question that I didn't get to on the list um, from a reader who is concerned that uh, it's a different uh, version of your question around First Amendment rights, but um, this person was worried about corporations really um, selling a lot of, of marijuana in the state of Vermont and that there would be limitations put on local growers. And, uh, and, and I don't know if there, maybe we could just wrap up with other questions too. Um, what do you have? Yes, we absolutely looked at that. Um, I, I think there's some important distinctions. Uh, well, first of all, I'll say, just because it's done in alcohol doesn't mean that's the way to do it. I think there's plenty of problems with the way alcohol is regulated and, and lots of things that could be addressed that are not being addressed. 
Um, and again, that was really the the commission tried to find tried to come up with what would be the absolute best way to regulate this if we're gonna if we're gonna legalize it. Um, so alcohol was, was certainly looked at. I think one of the biggest challenges with respect to adopting a straight alcohol model is the fact that um, that the the legalization of alcohol has been decades and decades and decades. We are in this transition period, and I think the challenge would be again, as as I referenced before, how do you bring these people that are currently participating in, the, in an illegal market into the legal market. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that the that all the tools to do that are in the existing uh, alcohol regime. But I do think that's a good model. I think the Vermont model is fairly good where the state has a, a fairly tight regulatory uh, uh, hold if you are going to allow a substance. Um, you know, again, it's not perfect but um, it, it certainly prevents, presents a, a model that, that could be explored. Okay, we have one more question right here and then it really is time to go. Yes. Do we know the cost of law enforcement, whether or not it's um, commercialized or not? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that using law enforcement now, mm -hmm. The testimony from, from law enforcement was uh, based on the presumption, their presumption and that I think reasonably broadly shared that if Vermont uh, opens up cannabis sales to a retail, legal re retail sales, more cannabis will be consumed in Vermont than is being consumed now. Uh, if you don't buy into that, then you, I can see you can say, well, we don't need any additional law enforcement resources. If you think that more cannabis is, and, and byproducts are going to be used in Vermont, then you might say, we need to beef up law enforcement. And I'd, I'd add, it's not, it's not just you know, law enforcement when we talk about you know, road um, side issues. I mean, these are, you, are, you have concerns um, about um, illegal grow operations. You have concerns about um, uh, public use, um, you might have concerns with sort of ordinance enforcement, um, there's been, you know, in other states there's odor, I mean, it could be something so simple as odor complaints um, from, you know, neighbor to neighbor. Um, so it's not just um, one small part of enforcement, it's sort of a, a quilt of issues that sort of pop up and um, Right, and so whether or not um, there are current resources to compensate what might be coming down with the increase of use, with no additional funding coming through or no additional uh, taxing or resources or revenue, um, that money would have to come from either the general fund for um, the troopers or it would have to come from property taxes if you have a municipal department. So um, I think that's why it's important to sort of um, be better prepared on the rollout, and then it's easier to pull things back as things um, move forward. Uh, it's harder to get things implemented after the fact. Well, thank you all for going to the weeds on weed. Uh, and if you, <laughs> if you wanna just come up after and ask your question, that'd be great. Thank you so much.